Hi, I'm Elizabeth Nadine, a geologist in the College of Natural Science and Mathematics here at UAF. Welcome to the Arctic Research Open House. Hello, my name is Gwen Holdman. I'm the director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. My name is Kelsey Nicholson. I'm the program administrator for the UAF Center for One Health Research. Hello, I'm Carsten Hüffer, Associate Dean of Edna Medicine and the Principal Investigator of the Biomedical Learning and Student Training or BLAST program. Hi everyone, my name is Sindonia Bretthart. I'm a professor in the Department of Biology and Wildlife and the Institute of Arctic Biology and I'm the science co-director of the Tulik Field Station. Hi, I'm Hayo Aiken, director of the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm Dr. John Blake. I'm the University of Alaska Fairbanks attending veterinarian, and I'm director of the university's Animal Resources Center. Hello, this is Brad Moran, dean of the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at UAF. I'm Bob McCoy, and I'm the director of the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Welcome to the 2021 Arctic Research Open House. I'm Nettie LaBelle-Hamer, the Interim Vice Chancellor for Research here at UAF. I'm also the Director of the Alaska Satellite Facility. This event began in 2018 when we invited the public on campus to meet our world-class scientists and explore fascinating research in climate science, geoscience, fisheries, engineering, and more. Then COVID hit. So this year we're trying something new. Over the next two hours, you'll hear flash talks from students and researchers studying a large range of topics, such as Arctic marine mammals, unmanned aerial and, and electric vehicles, generating power from renewable sources, and much more. These interesting topics will also help you learn about the benefits that UAF research provides to not just this year's students, but to all Alaskans and people around the world. We hope you enjoy this snapshot into our research picture. If you live in Fairbanks, we invite you to also join our outdoor scavenger event. All weekend, you can unravel science-themed riddles on the UAF campus to possibly win some cool swag. I hope you join us. All right. Yeah, we're trying to uh, get right to the juicy center of the lollipop um, and make sure that uh, we start to communicate those wonderful research um, insights and make sure that the community is able to partake in all of our scientific research that happens here at UAF. That's right. And one of those ways that that's been happening is Amanda's been putting together these research in a nutshell videos. And they kind of inspired us for how we were going to do this version of the event. And so that's uh, who we're going to be showing first. So please enjoy these research in a nutshell flash talks from the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. My name is Jeremy Vandermeer. I'm an electrical engineer and I work for the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. In Alaska, we have a lot of remote communities that are not connected by roads or transmission lines and they generate all of their own power. And as a result, the cost of power can be really high. I work on technical solutions that will help enable these communities to generate more of their power from renewable sources and to reduce their cost of power. Now, energy storage systems can greatly increase the amount of renewable energy that can be used. However, it is important to properly size and design the energy storage system to maximize the savings. A big part of my job is to work with utilities to properly size and design energy storage systems and to calculate predicted savings. I lead the development of the open source modeling tool, MyGrids, that was designed specifically for this purpose. Examples of projects include the one megawatt lithium ion battery that was installed in Cordova in 2019 to help integrate run of the river hydropower and the system that the Alaska Village Electric Cooperative is in the process of procuring to help integrate wind power into the remote villages of St. Mary's and Allen Village. In summary, I help communities reduce their cost of energy by working with utilities to help um, size and design energy storage systems to integrate renewable energy. Hi, my name is Erin Whitney, and I am a research associate professor at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I direct our solar technologies program and our data collection and analysis program. This is my dog, Barry. 
Today we're at the Willow Solar Farm, about an hour and a half north of Anchorage. This array is owned by Renewable IPP, one of our research partners, and together we are investigating coatings for solar panels that shed snow because of the increasing number of installations we are seeing in northern latitudes. These local sources of power can help offset some of our high energy costs in Alaska. We are working on this project and others around the state to support the responsible and equitable development of solar photovoltaic technology in cold regions and high latitude regions around the world. My name is Tom Marsik and I'm a Sustainable Energy faculty member at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where I'm split between the Alaska Center for Energy and Power and the Bristol Bay campus, one of our rural campuses. I also have a joint position outside the university, and that is with the Cold Climate Housing Research Center and the National Renewable Energy Lab. The main thing I do is that I collaborate on energy efficiency, renewable energy, and indoor air quality projects. For example, we are researching heat recovery ventilation systems in cold climate buildings. These systems take the heat from the warm stale air going out and transfer it into the fresh cold air coming in, so we can achieve superior indoor air quality without significant heat loss. In a nutshell, I collaborate to help communities increase energy security, reduce energy costs, and improve health. Hi, my name is Michelle Wilbur and I'm a research engineer at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power and I work with the Beneficial and Equitable Electrification Initiative one of the things we're doing with this initiative is looking at using electric vehicles instead of fossil fueled vehicles could be beneficial for Alaskans. One of the tools we've put together for that is to look at cold weather data for energy use for electrical vehicles or EVs uh, from Alaska and other cold climates and put together a calculator where Alaskans can choose their community and see if it might make uh, sense both from a cost standpoint and from an emission standpoint to switch to an electric vehicle. That can be found along with a number of other tools on our website, which is acep.uaf.edu. Hi, my name is Eloise Brown. I'm a research professional at the Pacific Marine Energy Center, part of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. My field is oceanography with a focus on ocean waves and hydrodynamics. One area of my research is to measure hydrokinetic energy from rivers in the ocean. I am working on wave energy as part of a larger project to assess renewable energy resources for the city of Yakutat, a remote community on the Gulf of Alaska coast. Three oceanographic moorings were deployed for one year offshore from Cannon Beach in Yakutat to measure potential wave energy. At the same time, members of the Solar Technologies Program installed a meteorological station to measure solar irradiance. Along with measurements of power consumption, these data were combined into a model to see how much wave and solar energy is needed to meet the town's energy demand and reduce fuel consumption. Many small communities in Alaska, like Yakutat, rely on diesel fuel that is barged in to generate electricity. My research is helping small communities in Alaska reduce their high cost of electricity by exploring alternative renewable sources of power. Hello, my name is Henry Toll and I am an undergraduate student in mechanical engineering at the University of Alaska Anchorage and also a student intern at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. A large part of my work involves data collection and analysis, and one project that I've been particularly glad to be a part of is called On-Site Real-Time Collection and Acquisition, or ORCA, which uses a Raspberry Pi mini-computer, like the one seen here, to collect data from powerhouses in rural Alaska and transmit it back to ASAP. 
a lot of older powerhouses in Alaska don't have a way to store or access long-term data, so the goal for ORCA is to give communities a cheap and easy way to collect that data. We currently have ORCAs deployed in Port Hyden, Clarks Point, and Galena, and we are already had an instance where powerhouse operators were able to use the data collected by ORCA to diagnose and fix an issue, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to install more of these devices in the future and they will continue to be able to help communities across Alaska. So thank you, um, Alaska Center for Energy and Power for those fantastic flash talks. Mike, what do you think about solar power in Alaska? You know, I, I haven't been living here that long and I recently attended a Solarize Fairbanks meeting and yeah. where they were discussing how solar could work for people in our area and the for the cost of power it really does make as much sense here as it does in arizona to put solar panels on your roof uh, mm -hmm. even though they're really working uh during a specific portion of the year right yeah uh solar panels have come down 80 percent in the last 10 years and uh uaf's research is really making sure that we can bolster both our communities and our industries which is fantastic yeah absolutely it totally anything that brings down the price of energy for communities and people right Absolutely. Everybody needs some power. Yeah. So uh, the next set of talks is going to come from the UA Press and the Institute for Northern Energy. So check these out. Hello, I'm Natalie Tyler, a PhD student in the Water and Environmental Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. In this presentation, I will briefly discuss my work with using Space-Borne Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR, to detect methane superseeps in Alaskan lakes. Previous studies have shown that methane produced by microbes in lake sediments is measurable with SAR. In the winter season, the bubbles produced by these methane seeps become trapped in the lake ice and are visible as very bright or high backscatter features in SAR imagery. The more bubbles there are, the higher the backscatter. However, this approach was not targeting very large methane seeps that are often associated with geologic methane sources. For example, hydrocarbons, coal bed methane, buried glacial organic, and methane clathrates. These large seeps or super seeps are considered rare and bubble rapidly enough to maintain large open holes in otherwise thick winter ice. I set out to quantify super seeps using SAR in three Alaskan regions, Utkiagvik, Atkusuk, and Noatak. To do this, I used the backscatter from previously ground true super seeps to train my method for detecting similar features across the landscape. These training seeps are visible perennially in l band SAR imagery, providing multiple years of data to use in this analysis. My end product shows how often a pixel showed up as a potential super seep. For example, the bottom left image is how one of the training seeps appears in the end product. The red pixels showed up in all four years of available data. The morphology or shape of this star detected feature is also very comparable to very high resolution optical imagery, which was used to validate some of our results. When comparing regional results to aerial survey work from 2012, this method detected over 10 times the previous density estimate for super seeps in northern Alaska. Overall, there may be more super seeps in Alaskan lakes than previously thought. Uh, welcome everyone, I'm Nate Bauer, the director of the University of Alaska Press, and with me is my friend Matthew Sturm, uh, Matthew, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, hi. I'm happy to be participating in the Arctic Open House. I'm Matthew Sturm. I'm a professor of geophysics. I've spent about the last 40 years studying snow. I published quite a few books um, with Nate, and so we're friends as well. So glad to be here. Yeah, terrific. To me, the book, Feel Guide to Snow, it, it takes an extremely familiar or even ubiquitous um, feature of our world and our lives as Alaskans and adds a lot of complexity and, and nuance and uh, if you'll pardon the pun layers stratification to to the subject of snow. Um, 
I wonder if you could just say a few things about the process of making the book, um, both as a researcher, the work that went into it as a researcher, and also as a writer. 40 years of snow research meant, and, and teaching it and teaching um, field courses, international field courses meant the subject had had a lot of time to think about what of the subject was really the most interesting. So, so that side of it was pretty straightforward. The second, though, is, uh, you know, my students know I'm very relaxed. I'm not a, you know, I just, I love snow and I talk snow, whether I'd be talking it to my kids or, or to first graders or anybody. So the goal was to just make it sound like I was talking to people. And probably the highest compliment I've had in the book so far is my middle brother, Judd, um, got back in touch with me after he read the book and he said it sounded like we were just sitting there talking and that that's really high praise because I think I can talk well about snow and I wanted to guide not everybody gets to talk to me so this was my chance to take people and make them feel like I was out in the snow with them just pointing to things so that trying to get that voice was the challenge of the writer and it just meant um keeping out of there anything that was going to get between people and the meaning, not, you know, not introducing too many words, but the concepts, people like concepts, they don't need the fancy words. So that was, that was kind of the challenge as a writer, um, cause I'm used to writing, um, y y you know, scientific papers with high, high language, fancy terms, you know, and I wanted to get rid of all of that cause it just gets in the way. I mean, snow is, everybody loves snow from what I can tell. I just wanted to make it very accessible. Um, thanks again, Matthew. And uh, thanks to everybody for participating in the Arctic Research Open House. Hey, thanks everybody. Uh, I'm back. This is Nate Bauer again. I'm the director of the University of Alaska Press and I'm here with Hayo Eichen, who's the director of the International Arctic Research Center. The book we're talking about um, here is called Community-Based Monitoring in the Arctic. Um, it's, a, it's a big collaborative work and it's something that is, a, it's a new publication, it's just out this year. It's, it's exciting to me, it's thrilling actually, as a member of the public, when I see and experience a project that is that has an explicit focus on, on bridging uh, the gaps that exist between uh, research and, and academia and uh, practical lived conditions of, of people. And that seems like it's definitely a focus of this work. Um, the the name, it's in there in the title of the book, community-based monitoring is maybe something that not everybody is familiar with. Can you describe what community-based monitoring means? Sure, yeah. So community-based monitoring is monitoring. Those are sustained longer-term observations of environments or, or other environmental variables, in this case, in the Arctic. Um, and they're not being conducted in the usual sense where you have university researchers or government researchers who are sitting outside of the Arctic often, or certainly outside of Arctic villages, Arctic communities, Arctic networks, um, instead of them saying, here's what we want you to measure, um, you have the community itself in the strictest sense, you would call it community led or community driven monitoring, um, identify, here's what's important to us, this needs to be observed. Um, some parts of community-based monitoring may also be more along the lines of what's known as citizen science, where you do have um, citizens who are collaborating with professional researchers. But um, in this particular book here, the focus is specifically on community-driven monitoring. In particular, a lot of these networks are led or driven by indigenous peoples in the Arctic. Um, and so it's, it's an important aspect of understanding Arctic change uh, also in a much more holistic fashion at the local scale, the scale of each particular community um, uh, as compared to more of the way the university type research would go in and start to sort of try to pull things apart and just focus on one particular element without really understanding or knowing the broader context. Fascinating stuff, Io. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Um, thanks for your contributions uh, to this volume and, and to your work um, on behalf of the university, on behalf of the press.
And um, if people have more questions about this book or any of our other publications, please don't hesitate to contact me uh, at the email address there, nate.bauer at alaska.edu. Thanks very much. Wow, that, those were really cool. Um, I'm always really excited about those. Uh, we do have a quick correction. That was from the Institute of Northern Engineering, the Water and Environmental Research Center, which is part of the Institute of Northern Engineering, uh, where we started off there. And then we came through UA Press. Uh, I, I love Matt Storm's point about everybody seems to love snow. Do you love snow? Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely a feature of my life here in Alaska. Um, I always think that it, it the snow in Fairbanks is also a little bit different. The way that it crystallizes and turns everything into like a shiny snow globe. I have to say that that has a special place in my heart. Oh yeah, for sure. I don't know that I had ever experienced that same thing until I moved here to Fairbanks and it's, it's a whole different thing. And the snowpack just stays for so long. There's so much to learn about it. And I will tell, tell you, this is not a quote for the TV. Matt Storm's book is in the mail to me right now. I, I am waiting on bated breath, so I can't <laughs> wait. And if you want to read the book, uh, I, either Matt Storm's book or the uh, book coming from Ohio Icon, you can head to alaska.edu slash UA Press, and you can pick up all of the awesome stuff coming out of UA Press there. Yeah. yeah. And I, I wanted just to say how fantastic it is that we are able to be here at least six feet apart. Sure. But um, last year, the event was canceled because of pandemic. But this year, um, thanks to the vaccine, we are both vaccinated, sleeves up Alaska. We are just so happy and uh, that we can put this on for all of you. We hope that you come out and do the scavenger hunt um, here through the weekend. Um, it's a really beautiful time to be on campus and uh, anything you're being excited about being uh, fully vaccinated now? Oh, just getting to see people again in person for the first time in a long time. It's been fantastic. So uh, I'm excited. I, I can't say thank you enough to everyone in the Fairbanks community who's been helping uh, to get people vaccinated and uh, to all of my colleagues and friends who are also vaccinated so that we can be here face to face, seeing people again. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, so the I guess we should throw to our next set of videos something that Hayao uh, didn't mention in his video there, but he's the director of the International Arctic Research Center, where I work personally, located in that pretty building back there. Uh, and we've put together a series of flash talks for our section as well. So let's spend a little time here hearing from the International Arctic Research Center. Hello, I'm Dr. Donna Hauser, a research assistant professor at the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. There's been a profound loss of Arctic sea ice extent, thickness, and the duration of cover. Sea ice loss has not only transformed Arctic marine ecosystems, but has also created novel changes in the access and availability of different Arctic regions. And no longer are we talking about an Arctic sea route that was experienced by some of the earliest European explorers, like Admundsen, who, is tra who transited the fabled Northwest Passage over a three-year period over a century ago aboard a 60-foot wooden sailing ship. If we fast forward to 2016, they had the first large cruise ship that was over 800 feet long and carrying over 1,500 passengers complete the sea route within just a few weeks. And ships represent a relatively novel risk factor for the seven Arctic marine mammal species. These are sentinel and ice adapted species, as well as culturally and ecologically critical to Arctic marine ecosystems. We also know from research at lower latitudes that marine mammals may be particularly sensitive to vessels because of their reliance on sound. We also know vessels could disturb animals or displace them from their preferred habitat or even cause direct mortality due to ship strikes. So I led a research team to examine the predicted vulnerability of 80 populations of these seven Arctic marine mammal species to vessels in the Arctic sea routes. And we considered two factors. First, that exposure is the degree of spatial overlap for the sea routes with each of the population's range. And second, sensitivity, which was a set of variables that considered the consequences of a population being exposed to vessels. We found that vulnerability to vessels varied among the 53% of the populations that were exposed to the Arctic sea routes. Whale and walrus populations were generally more vulnerable than the ice seals and polar bears. Overall, narwhals had the greatest vulnerability scores and that corresponded to their high exposure in the Northwest Passage region. Vulnerability also varied geographically. 
Alaska's Bering Strait region is a natural geographic pinch point. And so places like that were characterized by populations that had two times greater vulnerability than some of the more remote regions. And in these areas, there's high potential for conflict because it's an obligatory pathway for vessels, as well as the thousands of migratory marine mammals that use the area on a seasonal basis. Overall, an important take home message is that the responses, risks, and ultimately future resilience of Arctic marine mammals varies among regions, populations, and species, but also by risk factor. Thank you. A rapidly changing Arctic. Insights from community-based observations in two coastal Arctic indigenous communities. Presented by students Roberta Turuk Glenn, Elizabeth Mikup Lindley, and Kimberly Kivuk Pickle. Community-based monitoring as a means of documenting environmental change is not a new concept. Indigenous people of Arctic Alaska have been living, monitoring, and passing down knowledge of the sea ice since time immemorial. However, in recent years, community-based monitoring has been applied increasingly by Western researchers in rural communities to document environmental changes in a changing climate. Coordinated community-based observing can document local narratives of environmental change and inform a broader understanding of a changing Arctic. The Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub is a long-term community-based monitoring effort, which works with a network of Inupiat community observers in Alaska to document changing Arctic environmental conditions, including weather, wildlife, ocean and sea ice phenomena, and community activities. These observations from indigenous knowledge holders across Northern Alaska coastal communities provide a broad scale view of changing coastal conditions and ultimately impacts at the community scale. AOK supports communities across coastal Arctic Alaska. Here we share insights from two communities, Tikigap and Utkervik. Observations from these two communities about their changing environment include extreme weather events, such as flooding and erosion, seasonal cycle changes with impacts to subsistence calendars, and changing sea ice conditions, including more open water, thinner ice, unpredictable ice conditions, earlier freeze up and later breakup. Hello, I'm Maureen Bierman, Program Coordinator for the Center for Arctic Policy Studies, or CAPS. On behalf of CAPS director, Dr. Amy Lovecraft, I'm going to share a little bit of the work that CAPS does. CAPS is part of the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska. We facilitate the sharing of expertise from research scientists, practitioners, indigenous knowledge holders, and educators with decision makers in local, tribal, state, and federal governments. In times of rapid social and environmental change in the Arctic, our aim is to provide clear advice to policy leaders. Planning for tomorrow is a specialty of ours. We use futures thinking that includes not only modeling and scenario creation of the hard sciences, but also participatory engagement with a wide range of stakeholders to help create scenarios for the future so that people can feel more in control of their fates. Here's one example of our work. As climate change creates new opportunities for traffic in the Arctic Ocean and surrounding waters, many people see a growing need to expand the port of Nome. Doctors Brandon Boylan and Jeremy Spate are working to identify how a changing climate and changing port infrastructure may affect a variety of security concerns at multiple scales. This research helps us understand what it means to be secure beyond a simple understanding related to military or national security. This way of thinking takes into account the security of food sources, personal safety, and natural resources, for example. The outcome of this research will help the state of Alaska and its residents to avoid negative outcomes and to maximize the potential benefits of these changes. In another example of our work, CAP student research assistants Abigail Steffen and Stephen Arturo Greenlaw created a report on the history of climate change policy in Alaska. This report is very important because it compiles, for the first time, attempts and failures within the Alaska state government to create a comprehensive and lasting climate policy. It also catalogs local level climate plans in existence, which are shown on this map, that have been created by municipalities, boroughs, and tribal governments in Alaska. 
This CAPS report will help decision makers at the local and state levels understand what climate actions are already being taken, as well as what existing policies have been developed that may serve as blueprints for Arctic communities that wish to create their own climate action plans in the future. These are just some examples of, work, of the work that CAPS does. You can learn more on our website at www.uaf.edu slash CAPS or on Facebook and Twitter at Arctic Policy. Thanks for your time. Nice. It's always good to hear from our researchers and about all of the cool stuff that uh, IARC is up to. You know, there's another half of this event. So we're doing our flash talks here in this live event, but you can also do something on campus all weekend starting right now. Yeah, our scavenger hunt is happening across campus and there's prizes. Did you know there's prizes? I knew there were prizes, but I don't know that they knew there were prizes. Yeah. There's prizes. So uh, if you record yourself, do the whole event, then you can submit that for uh, t-shirts, swag, all sorts of cool things. And uh, you could also hashtag your photos, document them on social media. It could be, I am a scientist, or what's yours? Mine's uh, face of science. Face of science face is of very science. cool. Yeah, this yeah so uh, <laughs> let's check out that video starring our own personal favorite, Nook. Nook! fantastic i am totally doing that with my kids this weekend and uh what was that how do i submit it again you email your answers to uaf-research at alaska.edu absolutely that's right and then we get some swag and you could get, you could get some swag you could win some swag you're being entered to win and i know there's a lot of cool stuff in there uh like genuinely there's there's t-shirts there's there's stickers and all kinds of stuff and also rei gift cards so mm. Yeah, yeah, I got to prep for my outdoor adventure summer. That's right. That's right. I think we all need a new sleeping pad or a bit of money towards a new tent. We're all in that place, right? Maybe just a, or if maybe it's just a, a spray bottle of permethrin. We all, we all got to get where we're going to go. <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, so the next set of videos that we're going to be headed to, uh, we're going to hear from BLAST, as well as the Institute for Arctic Biology. So uh, I'm really excited to hear from them. Let's, let's get to it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Robert Coker. I am a professor of biology, clinical nutrition, and exercise physiology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. The title of my presentation is Nutritional Strategies for Metabolic Health and Aging. We know that the senior citizen population is expected to double to almost 100 million people in the United States over the next 40 years. We also know that Alaska has the fastest growing aging population in the U.S. This is important for a number of reasons, but in particular, aging increases the risk of muscle loss and obesity. Both of these are linked to an increased risk for metabolic disease and disability, not to mention an overall reduction in the quality of life. In 2013, I co-founded Essential Blends, and we applied for and received 
several small business innovation and research and technology transfer grants. In doing so, we worked very hard to develop an essential amino acid formula that overcomes anabolic resistance or the root cause of muscle atrophy with aging. We are now conducting our first randomized clinical trial using our formula in the elderly at UAF. This is a first for Alaska. Over the course of 24 weeks of weight management, we will establish the efficacy of our formulation in helping older people preserve their skeletal muscle. This effort has been funded through the National Institutes of Health Center of Biomedical Research Excellence Grant. In fact, our new Center for Transformative Research in Metabolism is leveraging decades of work in hibernation physiology to applications in clinical care. Finally, our connection with the University of Washington Institute of Translational Health Sciences and Northwest Participant Clinical Interactions Network will help us expand our ability to improve health throughout the West and the United States. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Olivia Hopgood. My project is an independent study that I am doing on the ability of Brassica ginsea, Indian mustard, to take up gold from Fort Knox mine tailings that might be left in the tailings. And my project is in progress right now. I've already done a small germination experiment to determine what mix of mine tailings and potting media that the plants will germinate in best because the assumption is that all mine tailings will just kill the plants and they won't be able to take up anything. But my plants are growing in the greenhouse right now in a mix of 50-50 potting media and tailings and they're doing really well. And I am really excited for the results of the concentrations of gold and other things in them because there have been some studies that show using Using acidic mine tailings for this kind of project is the most promising for getting high yields of gold. And if I do turn out to have like a reasonably high yield of gold from this, that would be awesome because that has awesome implications for using plants to mine low grade ore heaps or just tailings piles. And it's a much cleaner alternative to heap leaching. I mean, you do, you do have to use cyanide to get the, to solubilize the gold in the study that I'm doing, which you also have to use in heat bleaching. But there's also a lot more chemicals that go into heat bleaching more than just cyanide. And you also end up with acid mine drainage and these toxic tailings heaps. And it's, it's just not, there's better ways. And phyto mining has a potential to be very economical and very clean. And I think it would be really cool if this could be like an option for the kind of gold mine that we have up here. Um, um, Brasca juncea can also take up other toxic metals that might be in the mine tailings like lead, mercury, arsenic. And I am doing assays on both the soil and the plants to see what else is in the tailings. And what the plants end up being t able to take up. So not only could the plants have potential for getting gold out of these nasty tailings heaps, they could also be getting other pollutants that could end up back in the environment. So that there's a dual like economic mining slash environmental remediation um, application to this. Hi everybody, my name is Craig Chadwick. I am a student here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I am a part of the School of Management 
and a associated with the BLAST program um, here at the university. My research topic that I'm talking about here is going to be about uh, water services impact on subsistence activities. I'm currently conducting interviews with folks out in rural communities here across the state of Alaska and just listening to stor their stories about their relationship between water services or having access to running water in the home and how those uh, different levels of access change their ability to subsist. We are, I am documenting um, all of these folks' metrics, uh, individual metrics of success for both subsistence activities and how they gauge a successful uh, water service. So just ask them how they think, uh, or what, is, what does it mean to have a, or to be in, uh, or participate in a su successful subsistence activity, or what is a successful water service in their opinion? And really, I am just learning about um, any uh, relationship at all uh, documented from these uh, folks out in rural Alaska, their own personal perspective, any relationship at all between how water services uh, have impacted their ability to subsist. And it's kind of looking at it um, kind of a, a snapshot, uh, maybe a summer to summer, but for a lot of the folks that I've interviewed, uh, they're considered elders and, and um, you know, they've experienced a, a wide variety of water services and access over time. So that's been really interesting to see and listen and kind of listen to folks' stories about um, how access to water services have changed their ability to subsist over time. Um, so yeah, that is kind of my, my thing. Um, I'm, yeah, like I mentioned, I'm still doing interviews currently and listening to folks' stories about uh, how having indoor plumbing has changed their ability to subsist. And some of my, I would say some of my more interesting findings as I'm doing these interviews um, is how impactful an abundance of water um, changes folks' ability to subsist for themselves and uh, for their community members or their families and friends. And, and likewise, uh, the differences or impacts that they've noticed with the lack of running water has been interesting. Um, the individuals do have a very uh, subjective and personal metric of success for both subsistence activities. Uh, and then just the definitions of subsistence is, uh, is universal, but some a lot you know everybody has kind of their own individual metric of success, and it's been really interesting. I look forward to sh um, sharing all this stuff with you folks. So yeah, thanks. Bye. Those are some fantastic flash talks. It is always so great to see student research being supported. And those videos were from the Institute for Arctic Biology and last the biomedical student learning biomedical learning student training. So both of those programs um, do scholarships and research funding for students to gain real world, um, hands-on experiential learning, making sure that their research can really impact their academics. That's right. I mean, that's really, it's really cool. And, you know, the UAF research really turns, uh, turns investment into it all up, you know, for every dollar that goes into UAF research, we bring in $6 of external funding. We're bringing that in from various grant funders and all kinds of other sources. So uh, it's always amazing to see that going to research that benefits communities that supports the work that our students are doing, whether those students are undergrads or graduate students. Uh, or researchers building a bigger network of research relationships with communities across the state and across the world. Yeah, and did you know that just this summer, um, 2021, IAB gave out five uh, graduate fellows for upwards of $7,500 for them to conduct their own research. So the money that we bring in goes straight back out to students and research promoting um, our communities and our commitment to scientific learning. Yeah. So uh, let's have a couple more from, who's up next? We have the Geophysical Institute. Oh yeah, they're in the building right over there to the, to the right. And uh, this rocket here, 
This rocket here is launched from the Poker Flight Research Range run by the Geophysical Institute. So uh, let's hear a little bit from them. Hello, my name is Eric Peterson. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Geophysical Institute, and I study debris covered glaciers. These are glaciers with an extensive rocky recovering that changes the ice melt rate. For a thin debris covering, the darker surface absorbs more solar radiation and increases melt rates. But for a sufficiently thick debris cover, about several centimeters thick or more, the debris actually insulates the underlying ice and reduces melt rates. It's important to understand this process in great detail in order to model glacial change into a warming climate. In particular, for regions like Alaska, the Himalaya, and mountain ranges around the world where debris covered glaciers are common. To this end, I'm working on an NSF funded project with Regina Hawk on the Kennecott Glacier near McCarthy, Alaska in the Wrangell Mountains. We went out last summer and installed a automatic weather station on the glacier surface to measure air temperature, incoming and outgoing radiation components and wind speeds in order to constrain glacial melt models. We also installed melt stakes in the debris, uh, basically allows us to come back various times and measure the surface lowering as a proxy for ice melt. We also take a detailed look at the heat flux through the debris cover. Now this is the key component that makes the difference between a debris covered glacier and a clean glacier in terms of its melt rate. And in order to do this, we measure temperature at differing levels in the debris layer and apply a heat conduction and conservation equation as shown here in the middle. Now I've developed a new way to look at this equation, at least in the glacial subfield, to separate out the degree of heat that's conducted entirely through the debris and is available for melt of underlying ice versus the amount of heat that's lost to various processes. And what processes might we lose heat through? Well, for example, the melt at the base of the debris causes meltwater, which can be wicked up through the debris, similar to a soil, and is then evaporated at the hot debris surface. And a little bit of evaporation goes a long way in terms of uh, heat losses. And we see this average daily signal where we lose a lot of heat at midday, where we're also getting melt of glacier ice and hot debris surface. So this is really shedding light on one of the mechanisms by which debris can insulate the ice and reduce melt rates. This is a manuscript that I'm preparing to submit for publication towards the end of this summer. So I'll wrap up. Thank you for your attention. If you're interested in more on what we're doing on this glacier, scan this QR code for video content on YouTube. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the Arctic Open House. Thank you to everyone for listening to my flash talk today. We all acknowledge the Alaska Native Nations whose traditional lands our campuses reside. In Fairbanks, our Trothiella campus is located on the traditional lands of the Denada people of the Lower Talana River. Today, I'm going to talk about LAQUASI, the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration, and several example missions that focus on the Arctic environment and integrating unmanned systems into the airspace. LAQUASI sits within the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Director Cahill leads a diverse team of remote sensing scientists, engineers, pilots, business directors, operational leads, and airspace managers. The Quasi is the University of Alaska and State of Alaska's Unmanned Aircraft System program. We lead one of the FAA US test sites, known as the Alaska Test Site, as well as the Pan Pacific US Test Range Complex. We led one of the FAA Integration Pilot Programs, or IPP. This has now developed into the FAA Beyond program, where Aquasi leads one of the new teams. We are a key core partner of the FAA Center of Excellence for US, known as Assure, managed by the Mississippi State University. Aquasi has also developed and continues to work with several strategic partners that include NOAA, NASA, and Sandia National Labs. On the left, the first project focuses on working with Transport Canada and its surveillance of shipping lanes and waterways in the southeast regions of the country. Here, North Atlantic right whales move across the shipping lanes, and if one is spotted, there can be a significant impact to the transportation of goods through these waterways while ensuring safe passage for the whales. 
our missions, starting in 2018, focused on how large UAS could be used to map these lanes, detect any whale locations, and support Transport Canada to minimise impact while ensuring safety for the whale population. Reaching over 80 nautical miles from the takeoff location, the aircraft was able to traverse the shipping lanes and in recent missions automatically detect whales in the tens of thousands of images and get this data to the ground station. On the right, the second project focuses on recent work under a Small Business Innovation Research Award from NOAA, where I have been working with Kitware. Under our Phase 1 research, we showed that a small handheld sized GPU computer could automatically classify a river environment as fast as a visible camera could collect the data. Under Phase 2, we will integrate this system into a small UAS and evaluate the developed algorithm across river environments during several Alaskan winters. The objective is to build a real-time processing system that can classify the hazardous environment below the flight lines and send the vectorized maps to the decision support team as the aircraft is still flying. If you'd like to know more about Aquasi, our research and development, as well as our missions, then please do contact me at the email in the top left. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, I'm Melinda Webster from UAS Geophysical Institute. Today, I'd like to share a story with you about the journey in science from the largest Arctic expedition in history. The expedition took place in the central Arctic and there it focused on the sea ice system. Sea ice is incredibly important. It helps drive ocean and atmospheric circulation, regulates our climate, and it serves as a platform for people and animals to travel, hunt, and live. But the Arctic is undergoing drastic change. It's warming faster than any other region on our planet. As a consequence, sea ice is becoming thinner, younger, and less extensive. So why does this matter? Well, these changes have cascading effects on the atmosphere, ocean, and ecosystem, and ultimately, our weather and climate. It's these changes in the Arctic system that motivated a year-long drift expedition. This expedition was called Mosaic. It was a field experiment in which a ship was frozen into the ice pack to drift across the Arctic basin to study how the Arctic system functions over an entire year. It was huge. It involved more than 500 scientists and 37 nations, all focusing on better understanding how the Arctic is being affected by and affecting our changing climate. My participation in the expedition began in the spring, just as the sunshine was returning to high latitudes. With increasing sunshine comes a physical transformation of the surface. It goes from a frozen snow-covered ice scape to one free of snow and covered in melt ponds. My role in the expedition was to help document the seasonal evolution of surface and optical properties to relate to satellite measurements and climate models. I, together with my colleagues, are using this comprehensive suite of field observations to improve satellite retrievals and to develop new approaches for extracting information from satellite data, such as ISAT-2. We're also using mosaic observations to evaluate and improve climate models. In this example in the upper left, you can see a huge change in snow, sea ice thickness, and melt ponds from early spring and midsummer. Can models reproduce this change? So we compared the seasonal coverage of melt ponds and climate models and observations in the lower right. What we found was a pretty big difference. The models overestimate the area covered by melt ponds, which has important implications for surface albedo. This points to possible deficiencies in model physics, which we'll tackle next to improve our ability to accurately simulate sea ice and Earth's climate. To bring it back to the big picture, with the help of Mosaic, we're improving our understanding of the impacts of climate change on the different components of the Arctic system. By filling in these knowledge gaps, and by bringing observations and climate models together, we're improving our ability to predict our future climate and weather. Thanks for listening in. It's been a privilege to share this presentation with you. Look at those fantastic videos from the GI. Did you know that the GI has been on campus since 1946? that they have been studying geophysical processes from the center of the earth all the way out into space for going on decades now. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, they're one of the older research units. I don't think they're the oldest research unit on campus. I feel like someone somewhere in, in UAF would correct me if I said that, but I think they're 
they're they're up there nice. and i've been out repeatedly to the uh to the research range it's a really cool place IARC has some automated uh, me uh measurement devices out there so we're measuring rainfall and all uh rainfall and respiration inside the soil and temperatures and all this other really cool stuff right alongside the GI who are studying the Aurora with rockets at what might be the world's only university of rocket. Yeah, I gotta say that the Aurora forecasting is my favorite feature of the GI. I They are well on my refresh list so I can make sure that I catch those northern lights. Yep, right at the top of my bar, the GI Aurora forecast so that I know when the when the KP index is going to be high so I can go somewhere and get some good footage. All right, uh, I guess. So uh, we have something pretty fantastic coming up next. That's right. So uh, have you ever seen a nook try to put on a emergency suit because that's what we got coming up next along with uh, van white uh hio from the institute of arctic by oh and oh, oh yep. we have it ready they're getting ready they're taking off their shoes they are almost ready they're gonna grab their suits uh all right all right, are we ready? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third annual, when there's not a global pandemic going on, Survival Suit Challenge. So introducing our challengers for this year in order. A reminder, the Survival Suit Challenge is to put on the survival suit as rapidly as you possibly can. These suits are planned for when you have to nothing passive about it that's right this is for when you have to do what i would refer to as an unscheduled disembarkation from a vessel in the arctic ocean so in this corner with a past record of 52 seconds the chancellor of the university of alaska fairbanks our man dan why how are you feeling about this dan? i'm feeling good i'm feeling good you know i really been looking forward to this competition because you know this is where it counts and I'm ready. I'm ready for today. I think that this is an unfair advantage because he has already practiced this multiple times. I've never even seen one. <laughs> and with a record of 55 seconds, the director of UAF's International Arctic Research Center, Hi, oh, I can. And these two titans have two new challengers coming up against them. The challenger from within, the interim vice chancellor for research, Nettie LaBelle Hammer. But we don't just have challengers from within, we have a challenger from without. That's right, reporter for KTVF, Ryan Osborne. So when we give the, the, the signal, they will all have to get their suits out of the bag as quickly as possible and then put them on. We'll be timing them. Are we ready? Three, two, one, go. All right, they're getting the suits out of the bag. This is how they would be packed up inside of the vessel. So you'd have to be able to get them out and roll them up. Oh, we've already got one leg in both here on uh, for Hayo and Nettie. Oh, Ryan Osborne with the, the sit down style. We really like it. That Oh, look how efficient that is. We've got one arm here for Nettie. Hayo's got, Hayo's got two arms in. Oh, oh, but who's going to have the zip up first? Oh, it looks like it might be Ryan. Ryan's getting awful close there, but Nettie... <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we're having, oh, oh, and Ryan Osborne with the full zip up. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. <laughs> so so as, as you see, if, you, if you're ever getting on a vessel for the, uh, destined for the Arctic Ocean and they say, you really need to practice this first. Now you can see. It really is do a little bit of practice, but uh, look, everybody's getting in there just over a minute. I wasn't running a timer. I was too busy talking fast. Let's get a photo there. So, oh, hi-oh, hi-oh, yeah, there we go. 
So well done to all four of our participants here. Once again, Dan White, UAF Chancellor, Haya Wyken, the Director of the International Arts Research Center, Nettie LaBelle Hamer, the, the Interim Vice Chancellor for Research, and Ryan Osborne, our winner from KTVF. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, so uh, we'll let these folks get out of their suits. And in the meantime, we'll be seeing some really fascinating talks from the National Weather Service, who is co-housed right here up on, uh, on Westridge here at University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the One Health Institute. Hi, my name is Jonathan Chris. I'm a meteorologist with the National Weather Service and a graduate student at the Geophysical Institute within the University of Alaska Fairbanks. In this flash talk, I'll be discussing lightning and wildfire research conducted at UAF and bringing it into the operations of the National Weather Service as well as the Alaska Fire Service. The Alaska Fire Service maintains a lightning detection network as shown by the map in the lower left here. The data from the lightning detection network is live streamed to the internet in real time. So, and it's available to the public. So you, can you too can check this out in real time. The data is also used by the Alaska Fire Service in detecting and monitoring where new fires may have been ignited. The data is also useful in helping us track our thunderstorm climatology here in Alaska. Now, greater than 90% of acres burned in Alaska by wildfire are by, burned by lightning ignited fires. So it's really important for us to understand what causes lightning both on the short term and the long term timescale. Those fires are shown by the map here on the right, as we can see are mostly in the interior with all colored areas representing wildfire area bet burned between 1940 and 2019. Speaking of that thunderstorm climatology, the goal of this research is to improve both short-term and long-term lightning forecasts so that se skillful seasonal fire weather forecasts can be produced to aid in the allocation and uh, distribution of resources by the Alaska Fire Service and prevent unnecessary costs in moving resources both around Alaska and to between Alaska and the lower 48. In this study, we examine weather conditions during nearly 750,000 lightning strokes detected across Alaska since 2012. As we can see here in the plot on the upper left, the direction of the wind at, in the middle and upper levels of the atmosphere plays a big role in whether or not lightning will occur. Near Fairbanks, as shown by this plot here, we see that most lightning occurs during northeast or northwest winds at 700 hectopascals, or approximately 10,000 feet above sea level. This is important because this is not only helps us because we can potentially predict this on a long-term time scale, but we can also use this to improve fire weather forecasts produced by the National Weather Service, as shown here on the right, on the short term, which aid in short-term planning and resource allocation by the Alaska Fire Service. Thank you for watching this flash talk. And I hope you enjoy the open house. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Young, and I'm a meteorologist here at the National Weather Service in Fairbanks, Alaska, located on the UAF West Ridge. For today's presentation, I want to talk a little bit about some research I'm doing here in the office related to lightning in Alaska. So you might be wondering, why should we study lightning in Alaska to begin with? So in Alaska, we know that lightning is the primary driver for fire weather. So could there be certain lightning characteristics that are related to the environment matter that matters for a fi fire potential? And another aspect of reasons for study is uh, there's, there's few studies that have been performed to better understand lightning. So what can we learn from studies varying from yearly to daily scales? As you can see on this figure on the right, we already have some data and study being done in the past related to the local network that's been utilized in Alaska since 1986. And we can see here that the maxima in lightning density is here to the uh, east of Fairbanks. So, you know, how things, how are things evolving with time really matters for understanding lightning distributions across the state. So the objective, at least for what I'm going to show today, is to utilize the local network as well as a global lightning network, and then answering the question of how do these networks compare and what are the distributions. 
So looking at data from 2015 to 2020, we have the local network on the left and then the global network on the right. And we can see with the local network, the maxima in lightning density, at least from 2015 to 2020, seems to be more centered around central Alaska, just to the southwest of Fairbanks, as opposed to east or northeast, as if you recall from the uh, previous slide. Whereas for the global network, we're seeing the maxima being more located in the southwest portion of the state, with a secondary maxima in the eastern part of the state, uh, east of Fairbanks. So it's just trying to understand how these two networks uh, detect lightning, and then they're also their capabilities across the state, and then trying to understand how exactly it'll impact uh, things like fire weather potential, not only in the now, but how things might be evolving in the future. So further studies will be done on that to understand the uh, yearly scale, more or less, and then as well as the daily scale. So with that, that's uh, some of the research that I'm doing here at the office and uh, look forward to uh, having any discussion with anyone who's interested in this work. Thank you for your time. My name is Lori Mythaler Mullins and I'm going to talk about My name is Lori Mythaler Mullins and I'm going to talk about the Hub Outpost project. This is a project a joint effort through Colorado State University and the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. And we provide veterinary care to a region in Southwest Alaska that has previously lacked access to veterinary care. This region is the Yukon Kusikwim Delta in the southwestern corner of the state. And this region is completely off the road system and it's comprised of 58 federally recognized tribes spread among 48 villages in an area about the size of Louisiana. And these communities have historically lived very closely with dogs, using them for transportation up until 1950. And um, now they are still used for um, the sport of um, dog mushing, um, companionship, hunting. Um, dogs still serve very important roles in these communities. Our project was contacted by Nightmute um, just a couple weeks ago in March, this is March 2021, when a fox entered the community and attacked an unvaccinated dog. In this community of 280 people, approximately, uh, I would say most of the dogs are unvaccinated. So there was concern because foxes in this region have rabies. So we were able to get the fox sent in to where I live in Bethel and then sent on to Fairbanks, the state viro virology lab, confirmed that this fox did indeed have rabies. Um, and unfortunately, the dog that it attacked um, was shot. Um, but concerns with other dogs in the community who are unvaccinated. And this is Albert Olesk. Albert is a tribal police officer who helped our project um, when we visited the community of Nightmute. And Albert helped us go door to door to provide rabies vaccinations to um, all of the households in Nightmute. Um, so we traveled door to door to rabies vaccinate. We also provided distemper parvovirus vaccinations and antiepidemic treatments as some of the parasites in this region here that dogs carry that can be transmitted to humans also include echinococcus which causes some pretty serious disease in this picture here you'll see there's quite a few children watching the rabies vaccinations um, part of our project too we always visit schools and talk about dog hair veterinary medicine um, and One Health issues. It's not unusual since these communities have never had access to veterinary care. I often find in the schools, children aren't even certain, you know, what a what a veterinarian is, much less what they do. While in communities, we also provide spay need or sterilization surgeries to help reduce unwanted dog populations. So it's a combined One Health effort. Um, because we believe that improving the health of dogs. Awesome. Those are some, some really cool talks from the National Weather Service and from One Health. Before we go on, though, uh, we didn't have a chance earlier to talk about the time. 
that we ended up having. And the final time for Ryan Osborne was 33 minutes and 54 seconds. Or no, sorry, 33 seconds, 0.59 seconds, not 33 minutes. You didn't, you didn't all lose a bunch of time there for a moment. 33 seconds, 0.59. That is slightly longer than our all-time record, which was a student by the name of Rayleigh at some point in 2019, if I recall correctly the 2019 record so that's very cool ryan coming very close to the all-time record but not quite getting there everybody was in the suit in about a minute and a half though which is sufficient i think i think they would have survived i, I think, think they would have been survived. okay yeah yeah they're ready for uh, an unplanned disembarkation absolutely <laughs> and we just want to thank everybody who is um on live with us on zoom um we have folks who are across fairbanks across alaska all the way down to puerto rico with which we just think is so fantastic that we're able to host this event and reach so many people with uh, our great scientific research that is happening here at UAF. Um, and just the amount of scientists that are helping us to understand um, our world and our communities. That's right. So next up, we have the Alaska Sea Grant and the Animal Resource Center. That's right. Um, we're gonna check out some reindeer. I think we're going to learn a little bit about reindeer. Are, are you ready to learn about reindeer? Let's learn about reindeer. Who isn't ready to learn about reindeer? Hi, my name is Megan Parrott, and I'm a graduate student working with Todd Brinkman at the Human Dimensions of Wildlife Lab at UAF. We came to Lars because we wanted to answer a very simple question. What can a reindeer hear? We wanted to answer this because we actually studied caribou in the wild, which, despite having different names, are still the same species as reindeer. We're interested in how much caribou care about the noise created by humans, and specifically the loud sounds that can be created by industrial activity in the Arctic oil fields. And the next step to understanding that is actually to figure out what these animals are even capable of hearing. And there's already been some research done on this in the early 2000s, where scientists trained reindeer to respond to sound. This graph on the right is an audiogram, so each point represents a specific frequency and then how loud a sound has to be at that frequency for a reindeer to hear it. Now, a human can hear sounds between 20 and 20,000 hertz. According to these results, reindeer can hear between 63 and 32,000 hertz. Now, the reason we took issue with these results is because the frequency that a reindeer bellows at when it's in rut is actually 55 hertz. And we thought it was weird that, according to this, they wouldn't even be able to hear the sounds that they were making when they were trying to attract a mate. So we thought we'd approach things a little differently and test these results ourselves. Instead of testing a behavior, we used an EEG to look at the brain's response when a sound was played on an earbud that we stuck into the reindeer's ear. The EEG was set up so that it would record any activity happening in the animal's auditory system, so then we could see if they were actually perceiving the sound. So our machine was limited in the frequencies that it could actually play for the reindeer. So we could only really accurately test sounds between 30 and 16,000 hertz. In the graph to the right, you can see our results in black and the previous results graphed in red. Now, our testing methods can be a little less sensitive than behavioral testing, but we did find that reindeer can perceive sounds at least as low as 30 hertz, which means they can hear their own mating calls and the caribou in the wild are capable of hearing all types of industrial noise that they might encounter in the Arctic oil fields. These results should allow us to explore how caribou may or may not be responding to human made noise in the wild in our future research. Hi, I'm David Holm with the Alaska Sea Grant Marine Advisory Program. I'm coming to you from my home in Anchorage located in Denina Health Nena or Denina country. I'm the Coastal Community Resilience Specialist for Alaska Sea Grant. I'm excited to tell you about a project in the Bristol Bay region where I've worked for 20 years, first as a social scientist for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and now as an extension agent and researcher at UAF. Our project is a collaboration between the University of Alaska Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Penn State, and is a larger collaboration called Polaris, pursuing opportunities for long-term Arctic resilience for infrastructure and society, an NSF navigating the New Arctic initiative. The project I'll be talking to you about today is led by Lance Howie at UAA, Guan Jin Shi at Penn State and myself at UAF. Gabe Dunham, a Marine Advisory Program Agent in Dillingham has been key to the success of this project, as well as the late Dr. Todd Radenbaugh, who I'd like to acknowledge for his substantial contribution to science in Bristol Bay region. 
Our project includes epidemiological modeling to estimate outbreaks and demand for various medical and community resources to mitigate infection spread. We took into consideration various measures communities might put into place to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 within the fishery harvester and processor population and potential transmission to the local community. We administered an online survey to identify risk perceptions, responses to policy and compliance. Our first survey was administered this past summer and we received 926 valid responses. In December this past winter, we presented the findings to decision makers and stakeholders via a Zoom presentation. We then solicited feedback on what questions decision makers and stakeholders would like to see in a future survey and potential decision support tools. I have about 50 slides of survey results, but for brevity, I will cover two findings. We knew that Dillingham, the focus of our study, had a small hospital and if fishers or processors became ill from COVID, they would have to be transported out of the community at the expense of captains or processors. We also understood the uncertainty of the fishing season as salmon prices may be low due to lower demand nationally for high-end seafood products. Restaurants were mainly closed or had severe limitations in 2020. We also found that a majority of non-Bristol Bay residents felt that the economic benefits of opening the commercial fishery outweighed the potential extra costs associated with maintaining public health. However, when asked if they knew of someone who chose not to fish, a majority of both crew members and processors knew of someone who chose not to fish or work for a processor in 2020. We just released a second survey that focuses on attitudes related to vaccine hesitancy. In summer 2021, I hope to travel to Dillingham to conduct qualitative interviews to better understand our survey results. Ultimately, we hope to provide this data back to the community, partners, and hope that it will be useful to other fishing communities in Alaska. For full results of the survey, see the presentation we gave in December, with all 50 slides, available on our website, arcticpolaris.org. Thank you for attending. Awesome to hear from the Large Animal Research Station. I think that you can visit them this summer, like unlike in the past, right? There's you can indeed. They are operating summer tours under COVID um, restrictions, but from at 10 and 2, they are doing tours, and they have a fresh crop of baby muskox. Um, they are some of my favorite people to follow on Instagram, um, and you can find them on the web at uaf.edu slash lars, L-A-R-S. Yeah, I mean... Who doesn't love a good charismatic megafauna? Big fluffy animals, nothing's, nothing's more fun than that. And, uh, and it's, it's great to see how UAF is contributing to COVID research as well. You know, I, I think it's one of those things where it's, it's been dictating a lot of the work that we do. It's been dictating how we work here. A lot of us have been working from home, adapting to new circumstances. I'm sure a lot of you out there have been doing so as well. And, uh, and this, so the same goes for research. So there have been a lot of uh, really interesting projects which are trying to increase participation of uh, communities and individuals. So in this time that researchers a lot of the time can't travel. One good example of that would be the Fresh Eyes on Ice project. Have you yeah. heard of this one? No, I actually haven't. Please tell me more. Sure. So the Fresh Eyes on Ice project is using community uh, community based science to monitor ice breakup and yeah. ice formation along Alaska rivers in a way that is harder for us to do when we can't travel so freely when we can't fly and we can't uh, can't travel around. So it's helping us maintain a record of, of ice and understand our river ice better uh, by engaging community members. And that's been everything from from adults and scientists who are doing this in their free time, who might be researching something else, all the way down to student groups. So yeah. it's a really cool project and uh, just take a look for Fresh Eyes on Ice online and you can see how you could be involved in the future. I think that the Alaska Sea Grant and Lars also show us the resiliency of our research on campus um, and across the state. Uh, Lars has actually been operational since 1979. Okay. Um, and it is uh, fantastic just to see UAF modernizing with the times and being able to be adaptable towards um, real world problems that are happening in our communities right now. Yeah. Who's up next? Next up, we have the Institute for Arctic Natural Resources and Extensions. Actually, they might hold 
the title for longest operation on campus. I feel like they might as well. I feel like I've been told that the last time I got the, that, that fact wrong. So maybe while we're watching this, we can confirm that and come back. In Let's case do our own research and figure that out. Someone might also be in the chat telling us right now. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little far from me, but uh, yeah, let's uh, let's hear from them. Hi, my name is Lindsay Stadler, and today I'm going to be talking to you about food web ecology of nearshore fishes along a gradient of glacially influenced watersheds. Climate change is having near planet, especially in high latitude systems like Alaska. Increasing temperatures are causing glaciers to melt faster, which is increasing freshwater flux into nearshore systems. Why do we care? This can have major effects on things like food source availability, ultimately having the potential to alter the nearshore food web as we know it. For example, more fresh water into the system may be linked to more terrestrial organic matter versus marine. What will this mean for the future of our nearshore ecosystems? That's what I want to know. For my master's degree, I'm working with Dr. Katrin Eichen, researching how these important ecosystems are being affected. Specifically, I am looking at food web ecology of nearshore fishes along a gradient of glacially influenced watersheds in Kachemek Bay. I will be analyzing the diet of three species of abundant nearshore fishes at five different sites with a range of zero up to 60% glacial cover. I want to see if sites with higher glacial influence are linked with fish diets containing higher degrees of terrestrial organic matter versus marine. I will also be analyzing crescent gunnels seasonally from March to September. Within this time period, there are representations of before, during, and after peak glacial melt. This will hopefully allow me to see any potential seasonal changes in diet relative to glacial influence. Now, why focus on fish? Fish are important ecosystem integrators. They're fundamental to aquatic food webs, often serving as a link between primary producers and higher level consumers. Why the extra focus on crescent gunnels? They are abundant in the nearshore and are also quite sedentary, meaning they don't move around much. This makes them a great specimen for my study since I want to see if diets change based on site-specific variables. Staghorn sculpin are moderately mobile and starry flounder are considered highly mobile in the nearshore. These three species also vary morphologically as well as with their habitat use strategies and may serve as useful comparisons when com contemplating my main research questions, which are one, are there any effects of glacial discharge? Two, are there any seasonal changes? And three, are there any differences by habitat use strategies? To go about answering these questions, I'm analyzing both stomach contents, which will give me a detailed snapshot of what they've just eaten, and bulk carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes, which will give me an idea of what they've eaten and incorporated into their tissues over time. All of this will hopefully help in gaining a better understanding of how glacial melt influences the nearshore food web in the face of a changing climate. Thanks for your attention. This work is focused on Kachemak Bay and Cook Inlet. We're measuring ocean circulation using surface drifters, which are shown in the left two photos. The fabric veins of the drifters are designed to track the surface water motion, and the position of the drifters are telemetry to us every 10 minutes, and a GPS and a phone that are inside the orange and white float. Sets of drifters are deployed, as you can see in the right two photos, very closely spaced, and we look at the way the spacing between drifter pairs increases over time. This is a measure of how far and how quickly things disperse in the ocean. It's a nice mathematical quantity for ocean models. It's a good estimate for telling us how quickly things move about in the ocean. The drifters measure this quantity called dispersion. And you can see here, I've connected four drifters that are deployed in Kachemak Bay in the far left photo with red lines. And we're looking at how the distance characterized by those red lines increases over time. And the two color-coded cartoons in the middle show this relationship between distance and time. And that is our measurement of dispersion. And we look at that over hours and days. 
because we put four drifters in, we get six estimates, six distances between pairs to calculate this quantity called dispersion. This number tells us how larvae can be recruited and where they move. It tells us how fresh water mixes that's coming in from rivers and glaciers. And it's really important to telling us how pollutants might disperse in the area. So this work that we're doing is important to biology, ecology, ocean physics, and possible oil spills. What have we learned from this work? We can see all the trajectories for the drifters we've deployed in Kachemak Bay. And those drifters have gone throughout the Gulf of Alaska and up into the Bering Sea. The ones that we've deployed and redeployed in Kachemak Bay have revealed the surface circulation that's shown in the upper left. There's a counterclockwise circulation cell that you can see in the left part of the upper left picture. And you can see circulation in Kachemak Bay with strong speeds on the northern side of Kachemak Bay that exit around Homer Spit and head to the northwest toward Anchor Point. And we found out that the drifters that are deployed off of two glaciers in Kachemak Bay, and I'm looking at the right hand frame now, the ones deployed off of Gruink Glacier tend to stay within the bay. Those are shown in the blue trajectories. And the ones that are deployed off Wasnazenski Glacier tend to drift out and leave Kachemak Bay. This helps our understanding for where larva might be dispersed, where pollutants might go, and how freshwater mixing happens to occur in Kachemak Bay and Cook Inlet. Thank you. My name is Dr. Jesse Young Robertson. I am the co-director of research in the Forest Soils Lab, which is part of IONRI, the Institute of Agriculture, Natural Resources and Extension at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And behind me here, I have a field site where I will take you so that I can tell you about the research that's going on in the lab. So the leaves are coming out. And in a moment, I'll tell you why this is such an important time of year. Here is our data logging station. This tree is a white spruce. This sensor here measures growth and changes in size that are due to other things other than growth. And then this sensor down here, this white one, measures water content. Here we can see the same sensors on this tree. This is a birch. And we also have these sensors in Aspen. So our sites, we have approximately nine established throughout uh, the Fairbanks area and outside of Fairbanks. But this site is quite typical of a south-facing site with uh, either very deep permafrost or no permafrost at all. So with all these sensors and all these sites, what we are interested in is how much water the trees are using and what their patterns look like over the year. So, for example, we know that the snow has been melting over the last two to three weeks, and this is when the birch trees get very, very full of water. And so anyone that taps birch trees for sap knows that we're almost right at the end of the season for being able to get water from those trees. Because as I showed you earlier, the leaves are coming out and the trees are going to move a lot of that water into the atmosphere. But the trees, the white spruce, the aspen, and the birch store a lot of the water in their trunks and they use it over the summer. And so it helps them when we have really dry periods because they're holding on to their own water that they can sip from. Now if it rains, they will also use that water. But what we've found is that the trees take up a really large amount of snow melt water and it's critical for their survival. Another aspect of our research is determining the best time of the year to harvest your firewood so that the trees are at their lowest water content. Wonderful, yet again. Yeah, absolutely. And we were right. They are the oldest on campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we were right. I'm excited about that. And uh, we, we showed these, these hashtags earlier, but I've been informed that I, 
this has a really cool meaning, the face of, of, of science. Uh, so the, the personal face of science is meant to empower people to make informed decisions regarding societal issues based on science. Yeah. So it's just another way that research and science is benefiting society and uh, the people around us. Yeah, well, I love science. And uh, that's the reason why we are all here today. That's right. And uh, next up, we are going to be hearing from the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. Right. Do you know that they are the one of the few programs, one of the few icebreakers um, that they have at the Sisuliac, which I think is one of the coolest programs for a student to be able to get involved with yeah and getting, uh, getting up there on the sekuliak is like just one of the coolest things you could do so i'm always jealous oh. i haven't been there yet i haven't yeah. i haven't but we'll, I'll, i was I'll get about there. to get jealous I'll, find, I'll, I'll figure it out i just gotta you know i don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> probably not, but well uh we will hear from uh, cfos in these next great flash talks Hi everyone, I'm Brenda Konar, one of the research leads for the EPSCoR Fire and Ice Project. I'd like to introduce you all to the ice component in my talk entitled, It's Getting Warmer, The Influence of Melting Glaciers on Coastal Ecosystems. Now we all know it's getting warmer out. And in fact, global temperatures are predicted to increase by one to three degrees C by the year 2100. Now this warming is causing our glaciers to melt and glacial global mass is predicted to decrease by 23 to 40% during this same time period. Now on this graph on the left, you can see an increase in the loss of glacial mass over time. This shows glacial mass in many different systems around the world. Now you can see the dotted black line is the average glacial mass. And here I've highlighted in red bold Alaska. And you can see like everywhere else, the glaciers are melting in Alaska. And in fact, the past few years and projected into the future, they're gonna be melting at a faster rate than the average. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I thought I would show you these two images. The one on the left was taken in 1894. And you can see that this glacier, which is the Mendenhall Glacier in Juneau, which many of you probably have visited, you can see that the glacial extent is in about the middle part of the picture. Now, this image was retaken in 2015 from about the same vantage point, And you can see that this whole area is now water. And in fact, the glacier is pretty far back into the background. Now, what my team is doing is they want to better understand the impacts of melting glaciers on coastal ecosystems through the associated changes that are occurring from the land into the ocean. Now, we're doing this in two different systems in Alaska. The first is Lynn Canal, which is in southeast Alaska, down by Juneau. And the other one is in Ketchemek Bay, which is by Homer in the northern Gulf of Alaska. Now, in each of these systems, we have multiple watersheds that have varying amounts of glacial coverage, and we're measuring a lot of different variables. We're looking at snowpack and the amount of glacial melt and discharge that's coming out of these glacial areas, and we're looking at how they're transporting terrestrial material and estuarine production into the ocean. Now in the ocean, we're looking at a lot of different variables too. We're looking at everything from the rocky intertidal communities to the fish communities such as salmon and forage fish, and also the plankton that feed these communities. Now we're in year three of this five-year project, so I'm really excited to be able to introduce you to it. Um, hopefully you enjoyed my talk and enjoy the rest of the talks during this open house. The Ocean Acidification Research Center is a service laboratory within the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, located on the Trothyda campus. Ocean acidification is the result of anthropogenic increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide that is later absorbed by the ocean, causing a decrease in seawater pH. Placement of this center in Alaska is critical to the state's long-term interests because the region will experience the effects of ocean acidification faster and to a greater degree than in lower latitudes. This is due to colder water temperatures, ocean circulation patterns, and highly productive continental shelves. We specialize in monitoring the carbonate system in coastal waters with the magnitude and variability 
of carbon cycling is higher than in the open ocean. Our research focuses on high quality observations. We use platforms such as moorings, including sensors that monitor seawater carbon dioxide and repeat hydrographic cruises to determine the intensity, duration, and extent of ocean acidification in the Pacific Arctic region. As a recharge center, we also accept seawater samples from different user types, including oceanographers with federal and state agencies, biologists conducting experiments on the effects of ocean acidification on various species, and nonprofit organizations. We analyze the su submitted seawater samples for dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity. Our data are publicly accessible on our webpage, where you'll find records from Alaska's coasts, including projects in the Gulf of Alaska, Bering Sea, Chukchi Sea, and Beaufort Sea. We also submit all of our data to the synthesized global carbon products. In this United Nations decade of ocean science, we are contributing to the global objective to implement new science and build on existing science to understand the cumulative impacts to our oceans from the changing climate. Understanding and monitoring ocean acidification is critical for our local, regional, and global blue economy. Please contact us for more information and stay up to date on current events on our Twitter feed. Hi everyone, my name is Shelby Backus and I'm a marine biology graduate student working with Dr. Amanda Kelly here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And today I'll be discussing broadly my research which looks at the effects of multiple stressors on the behavior and physiology of an intertidal grazer and a key sea star predator. So our oceans are in a current state of change, and this change is largely driven by anthropogenic forces, which is the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation. And we know that our oceans are going to both acidify and warm concurrently. However, research has historically examined these stressors on marine organisms individually rather than interactively. And this is why multiple stressor experimentation is such an emergent area of study. And my research examines both the individual, but also the interactive effects of acidification and warming on the Pacific plate limpet, which is an important intertidal grazer, and its key sea star predator, which is the monster here in Alaska's nearshore ecosystem. And what research is finding is that ocean acidification and ocean warming can affect things such as basic ecological processes, such as behavior, by influencing other important drivers, such as physiology, neurology, environmental cues, and resources. And because of this in particular, I personally like to take a multidisciplinary approach to my own experimental design in order to, to really tease apart how marine organisms here in Alaska's nearshore ecosystem might respond to a changing ocean. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We're back. Sorry, I was just uh, just practicing my Danish, something about uh, uh, Brooks and Visning, something like that. Uh, it's in English on the other side. <laughs> so. Well, we just wanted to thank everybody for joining us um, in these fantastic flash talks, all of the researchers, all the students who put these together for us, yeah, and the many people who actually helped us put this event on today. That's right. A lot of people across the University of Alaska Fairbanks, both inside of the research units and outside of the research units, were integral to making this happen. So on top of all the research units that you've heard about today, we couldn't have done this without eCampus, facilities, university relations and the office of information technology who helped us get out into the middle of this field with an ethernet connection uh which is not an easy thing easy thing to do so thanks to all of those folks and uh, also thanks to the many media organizations um in fairbanks who helped us get out the word who um, helped sponsor this event with uh just making sure that people know all of the fantastic things and reaching all the way out to Puerto Rico um, through to Fairbanks. And we also want to remind everybody that this is not the end of the event. It goes all the way through the scavenger hunt. Yeah. Um, and we're going to play that Nook video one more in a, time. In a minute, yeah. But first thing I wanted to mention here is that this isn't the only place that you can see these videos. So if you okay. at any point here were like, oh, I wish I could go back. I wish I could see that again. First of all, of course, 
the the video will be recorded on Facebook if you're watching this on Facebook, so you'll be able to set, watch the replay. But also, you can head to the UAF YouTube page, and there's a playlist there uh, that we're going to drop the link to in the chat here, hopefully, and hopefully post on the Facebook as well. Uh, and that playlist will have all of these videos, plus a couple that had to be cut for time that we just didn't have enough time to, to show. So everybody from famous local authors all the way through to uh, other researchers from across the units. It's a, it's a great place, and we highly recommend you head over there. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, finally, do not forget, if you are in Fairbanks or if you're within driving distance of Fairbanks, looking at you, Anchorage, come on up here and, uh, and walk around the University of Alaska Fairbanks and do the scavenger hunt. It's, it's really awesome. And, you know, uh, I'll be competing. I'm looking for that REI gift card. I need a new sleeping mat. <laughs> so thank you so much thank you for for being here on camera yeah, well thank you mike of course and uh thanks fantastic. to our camera operator nook of course as well uh, behind the scenes making this all happen thank you all and uh thank you for being with us here today have a good one